Welcome to Conversations. I'm Bill Crystal, and I'm joined today by Paul Cantor, as I've been several times before. We've discussed topics ranging from Shakespeare to popular culture in various forms, and today we're going to talk about the Western. That's okay with you? That's fine. I'm glad to do it. I am too. I've always been a fan of the Western, and it's generally considered a great American genre, I guess, and so we'll talk about its history in, in, in movies and maybe other little bit in other media as well, but what is the Western? Okay, that's a very difficult question to answer, and I've been thinking about it for years, and I think I finally figured it out after writing three books on popular culture. Actually, in the course of writing my... This is going to hurt the sales of, the first, of those three <laughs> books if you only just figured it out now. You know? Well, you learn <laughs> while doing. Uh, I'm going to try to separate popular culture out into two broad categories. Uh, and it, it's works that are set in the middle class world, uh, versus works that are set in alternatives to the middle class world. Uh, it sounds overly simplistic, but let's see if it works. That is, uh, I think a lot of uh, works in popular culture uh, are set in contemporary America, in a world that's both basically middle class and its values, world that's a uh, liberal democracy. I have in mind here things like situation comedies, romantic comedies, most shows about professional life, doctors and lawyers and so on. And what I'd say is in these works, the regime is invisible. It's just there. It's what we ourselves live in, and people accept it. Uh, they don't notice its presence. It's like fish in water. They don't notice the water. Uh, uh, and that, to me, contrasts with works which deliberately seek out an alternative to that world. And the Western will be my primary example of that. But I would include a lot of science fiction, a lot of horror stories, something like Game of Thrones, for example, these historical dramas. Uh, now, this contradicts... Maybe a, the gangster movie, too, I oh, think. Oh, the gangster movie, absolutely. How could I forget it? I, uh, Warshaw has those essays of yes, the Western yeah, and the yeah, gangster yeah, no, movie, which uh, say these are both al alternate... Right, and that's where I began to understand uh, this division. And by the way, the Warshaw essay on the Western has this fantastic line, says, uh, uh, if you want to understand the Iliad, you go look at Westerns. And, and I think that's really profound because what we're talking about here is returning to a kind of Homeric world uh, where the values are aristocratic and heroic. Uh, now, to talk about this a bit philosophically for a moment, uh, we all know this view that's called historicism, that uh, uh, works of art always reflect the time in which they're set. And there's a certain truth to that, that uh, even when uh, contemporary authors try to portray a past period, they often are deeply anachronistic in any sense. But uh, I think it's wrong to think that people can't escape the setting in which they're writing. And indeed, I think one of the uh, chief goals uh, of, of some writing for the authors and for the audience is to escape their, their world. Uh, so what I'd say, using the Western as, as an example, it goes back to an earlier time before the middle class world was settled. Mm. Uh, and it, it, it therefore allows it to portray a set of values that are Homeric, uh, heroic values. Uh, in the Western, uh, what matters is strength. Uh, and skill with a gun and all these heroic uh, qualities. Uh, now, it's particularly interesting about the Western that it often is portraying the emergence of the settled middle class world. We'll talk about this, I guess, in connection with John Ford. Uh, but very often, uh, uh, these uh, author, these creators of Westerns choose a moment uh, when uh, the frontier is closing down, when the age of the heroic gunfighter is coming to the end. And many Westerns specifically deal with the later life of a gunfighter, uh, curiously correlated with the later life of the actors who play right. gunfighters, uh, John Wayne and Clint Eastwood being good examples of that. Uh, so, uh, you know, on the one hand, we have this broad group of uh, uh, works, again, romantic comedies, situation comedies, professional dramas, uh, that just operate within the middle class world, accept its values. You can see why these works have such an audience. 
people are generally middle class in this country. They it's enjoy, their world. It's, it's their Seinfeld, world. Friends, right? It's yes, like watching yeah. people yeah, you might like know. Yeah, it's like watching a mirror of yourself. Right. Uh, and in a way, it's like the world of gossip. What do people talk about? Uh, who's having an affair at the office? You know, how is this marriage going? Uh, people don't uh, gossip like... Uh, did you see that guy that Bob murdered last week? <laughs> uh, it was really a cool hit job. Uh, uh, so generally, audiences want to see their own world represented, uh, and it, does, it doesn't challenge their assumptions. It's very easy to consume. But on the other hand, there's a broad set of works in our popular culture uh, that do offer an alternative. Now, again, you brought up gangster movies. <laughs> they, uh, they take place in a world where people probably do gossip about murders. Uh, right. Did you see the guy that Vinnie whacked last mm -hmm. week? Uh, uh, and and uh, so these works have a different attraction to them. Uh, uh, they offer us an alternative to the world we live in, and there's a kind of <coughs> vicarious excitement in watching some works. Uh, if there's nothing else you can say about the middle class world, it is boring. <laughs> It's the world of compromise, <coughs> of moderation. <coughs> That's why generally this um, uh, class of works are comic in spirit. Uh, there are problems, but they're always resolved at the end. Uh, the marriage uh, gets put back together. The uh, quarreling couples learn to adjust to each other. Middle class drama is all about adjustment, about settling things, and it's that sense uh, comic. Uh, this other broad category is uh, tragic, uh, and it's often tragic precisely because it portrays a conflict between middle class values and something else, some kind of heroic ethic, which again is always associated with the past, as indeed the middle class world did grow out of an aristocratic world um, historically. Uh, and so there's a certain fascination just in seeing something different. I have to confess, I'm typically attracted to uh, westerns, to gangster movies, to horror movies, to sword and sandal epics, uh, because, you know, I, I really, I, had, I have enough to do with the middle class world. I li I've lived in it all my life. And so you can see the attraction of seeing something different uh, and seeing a kind of hero that you don't see in ordinary life. Uh, but also there's a theoretical component to it that I find really interesting, that uh, this broad class of works are making us rethink the middle class world by precisely by seeing alternatives to it. And in particular, what I've seen is, particularly with the Western, these are state of nature stories. Uh, uh, they take us back to a period of anarchy, or at least of a period where uh, middle class values are not totally imposed on everybody, and in particular, a world in which institutions are not as well developed uh, as they are today. And that raises very interesting questions. Uh, we are just you know, surrounded by institutions in our lives, and everything has to be done uh, by uh, procedures and rules, rules and regulations. Yeah. And people are very frustrated by that, they want to escape from the world of the DMV. Uh, and to do that, you have to go to the Wild West. And uh, where things are settled mano a mano, where, uh, in fact, uh, <coughs> everything's much more personalized. You know, I think that's why Game of Thrones is so fascinating to people, because it's not a world of procedural majorities in the Senate. You know, you just got an opponent, you just kill him. And, most of us have had moments when that's how you wanted to solve your problem. And again, we can't do that uh, in our lives. So we enjoy seeing stories where it does happen. I think there's something cathartic <coughs> about Westerns and in general, uh, these forms of popular culture that offer alternatives to our middle class uh, world. Uh, so it is a world in which uh, at best, 
the institutional settled world, the world of police is emerging. Again, we're fascinated by police dramas, but they're so they're called procedurals, by the way, in technical jar- jargon uh, uh, in the TV business. And it's interesting that th- th- we have that name because, uh, indeed, it's all an issue of procedure. Did the police gather the evidence correctly? Uh, is the judge following the law? Uh, we love, as an alternative, the gunfight. Well, the police dramas typically, I mean, I think, restore the order in which we live. Yes. They reassure us. At some it, level, it, most of them, not all of them, yeah. some are darker yeah. and no, raise but, the question about the whole order, but yeah. most of them reassure yeah. us that that order can be restored yeah. with and, good uh, policemen or good DAs yeah. or I good, mean, that whatever, goes good private all, eyes. It you know. goes all the way back to Doyle and the Sherlock Holmes stories, that they were very reassuring to the Victorian audience, which had all sorts of anxieties about things like immigration, for example, that Holmes could solve the problems and restore order. And we're attracted to that, but we're also attracted to shows that show what life was like without the order. And there it gets really interesting in the Western uh, that they do show a world where uh, people have to resolve their differences on their own. Uh, Vengeance is such an important subject in the Western. Uh, uh, The Searchers is a great example of that. Clint Eastwood's uh, uh, Unforgiven. Vengeance is such a great theme uh, in the Western and illustrates what I'm talking about because uh, uh, we love poetic justice and we don't get it in the world. Uh, You know, uh, uh, we're so sick of plea bargaining and reduced sense and so on. We like to see the issues settled by one guy with a gun who just shoots the bad guy. Uh, uh, And the question that arises out of this though is what kind of community do, does it result in? And I'm going to broadly divide Westerns now into two categories, those that follow Hobbes and those that follow John Locke. Uh, and this, this works out pretty well. That is, in many Westerns, uh, they do reveal uh, a world of anarchy. Uh, and uh, many Westerns are very dark in their vision uh, of what the human race is like, the uh, so-called spaghetti westerns of Sergio Leone, which I hope we get to, or maybe the best example of that. But they are a world in which people cannot order their lives on their own, and they need the man on horseback with the gun to settle things. And that's Hobbes's Leviathan. Many westerns portray a world that, like Hobbes' state of nature, is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And it's amazing how Hobbesian the vision of many Westerns are, and they lead to the conclusion that you need absolute sovereignty. You must yield all your freedom to someone who will bring order. Uh, And again, there's a lot of Westerns like that, but there are a lot of Westerns that are just the opposite uh, and, and, and take... John Locke's view. And John, John Locke's view of the state of nature, uh, at least uh, in the uh, obvious sense in uh, his treatises on government, are that it's less harsh than Hobbes' view. And in particular uh, for uh, Locke, uh, property was possible before government. Uh, that people could organize themselves uh, and and develop a system of property. Uh, uh, and and Hobbes, uh, Locke's principle was that uh, the land is yours if you work it, right. uh, which, as people have shown, is actually was translated very quickly into English common law and was the basis of s- the, the Homestead Acts right. uh, in U.S. history. Uh, 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 and indeed, there, there, there's a wonderful book uh, uh, by Perry Anderson and Peter Hill called The Not-So-Wild Wild West, Property Rights on the Frontier. If you really want to learn about the West, I, I really recommend that book. And it shows the amazing degree to which various uh, elements in the West could organize themselves. There were mine owners associations, there were cattle owners associations, and in the absence of law, indeed of the absence of legal authorities, they found ways to establish mine claims, land claims, water rights claims. Uh, the book is very interesting. For example, it shows the great paradox of the West was the English common law tradition developed out of England, where, for example, 
There's more water that he can do with. It's a rainy, rainy country. And uh, English common law was not adaptable to the West, which was so arid. And and it shows how people organize themselves uh, as associations uh, uh, to establish water rights. This is very much Tocqueville's view of America again. This is kind of sort of Locke and Tocqueville spirit to some Westerns. Tocqueville's great claim is Americans can form associations on their own and solve their problems. And that's what Anderson Hill show about the West. It's really quite remarkable uh, how they show that in, for example, California, the miners established their own claims and then later the government came in and just legitimized them. It's very uh, much in the spirit of Friedrich Hayek and the idea of spontaneous order uh, that people organize themselves and then uh, at best the government ratifies it. Uh, and so, and again, a lot of the John Ford movies have this view. It's the famous scene of the barn burns down and the whole town says, let's go help Farmer Brown, let's raise that barn again. Uh, that would not happen in a spaghetti western. Uh, do you agree that whether it's the Habesian West or the Lockean yeah, West, yeah. I mean, one of the attractions is it's an alternative to the, as you call it, bore, boring or yeah. bourgeois society that we live in but it's also in the past and can't really be revived. That's sort of a lesson. And therefore you can both appreciate it and sort of yearn for it, but it's a kind of nostalgia. It's not a living alternative, so it's less threatening in a funny way to the bourgeois. Yes, exactly. Consensus uh, or whatever. No, uh, uh, it, it shows the emergence of our order out of something that was very different and required heroism indeed. And that we should admire, but we can't really go back to. Yes. Uh, I'd say the Anderson and Hill book, which is, again, not fiction, but history, can teach us some important lessons no, no, about no, the world think, today. No, no, I think the Western, uh, too, maybe, also, yeah, that you should yeah. respect these traits uh, more, but somehow it also is less dangerous than it might be. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's less not like, threatening, right. but again... Uh, what I, you know, as a professor, what I like about them, about them is you, they can make us think about. Right. Uh, uh, I, I wrote an essay on Deadwood in my Invisible Hand in Popular Culture book, and it really was Deadwood in the State of Nature, and I went through Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau. It's a, another aspect of it to show how Westerns can illustrate right. these really important uh, ways of political uh, uh, thinking. So that's that's my intellectual. Uh, interest uh, in in westerns, uh, and then as I've studied it, one aspect I've gotten fascinated with is the way in which the West created its own myths. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Because people sometimes think it's sort of just emerged, yeah, you know, so, organically, so to speak. But so I think that's not yeah. the case in yeah, either literature yeah. or yeah. or uh, popular culture or high uh, literature or popular in, culture. The gunfight at the OK Corral uh, was in 1881. The first Western was made in 1903, movie, uh, uh, The Great Train Robbery. That's amazing. Uh, Trojan War took place maybe 1150 B.C. The Homeric poems started coming into existence around 750 B.C. 400 years it took. Western, it took less than 40. Uh, uh, And uh, now that's one nature of the modern media. media. There were movies being made about World War II during World War II. So now things have uh, quickened up. But just think if Homer had met Achilles... And if Achilles had told Homer the stories, probably not. And that's why uh, they're so fantastic in a way. Uh, But I was quite surprised to see to what extent uh, these Western heroes actually created their own uh, legends. Uh, Let me, there's some dates involved here, so let me refer to some notes I have on this. But uh, uh, these so-called dime novels were being written already by the middle uh, of the 19th century, uh, uh, creating uh, stories about these legendary uh, Western figures. And the most important of them was Buffalo Bill Cody. Uh, And here I'll introduce the figure of Ned Buntline, uh, who lived from 1821 (laughs) to 1886. Uh, His real name was Edward Zane Carroll Judson Sr. So even this name 
Ned Buntline, which I grew up with, Ned Buntline was a character in the U. O'Brien Wyatt Earp TV series. Now I learned that was a nom de plume there. Uh, uh, but he started writing uh, stories of Western outlaws, and he was fascinated with Wild Bill Hickok uh, and approached him, and he didn't want a story written about him. But he introduced Buntline to Bill Cody, uh, and actually, Buntline figured out this guy's more interesting. Hmm. And so the legend of Buffalo Bill Cody was basically created by Cody working with this guy, Ned Buntline. Uh, and when is this happening about? Uh, 1869 is when they So met. this is right after the Civil War. Yes. Which and must be so, somehow important, too, that it's like absolutely, a post-Civil War yes, so unifying many, story or something? Yeah, well, or, uh, or actually, in many cases, uh, the... Um, the outlaws are uh, Johnny Rebs. Yeah, that They're was Confederate what soldiers. I mean, this is uh, uh, Ethan Edwards and John Ford's and Searchers. So a lot of the Western grows out of the time of post Civil War when the nation's trying to uh, unify and, right. and, uh, and people are resisting it. Uh, uh, and so. It, uh, 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 Western heroes are almost systematically divided into uh, Republicans uh, and Confederates. Mm. Uh, uh, but I, in, in 1869, Buntline wrote Buffalo Bill, King of the Border Man, which was serialized in the Chicago Tribune. I love these details of the, this story. Uh, and that was the first Buffalo Bill novel, very successful. And then they decided to take it to the stage. Uh, not the stagecoach, but the theatrical stage. And again, this is so fascinating. What you learn in the 19th century is all these things we associate with the modern media were already being done in the 19th century. So in 1872, the Scouts of the Prairie uh, appeared in Chicago, uh, produced by Ned Buntline. And Cody was an extremely handsome and impressive man physically. He was not a great actor, but he was able to dominate a stage, and, and this became very successful. Uh, in 1873, Cody invited Wild Bill Hickok. And what are these stories about? Are they are they settling the West? Are well, they can, fighting King Indians, of, King, King or are they the, fighting yeah, each other? Uh, uh, King of the Border Men, Scouts of the Prairie. You can see that it's it's all the frontier. Civilization meets bar barbarism. A lot of it is uh, the Indian Wars. Uh, uh, and which were happening in real time. Yes, uh, yes, uh, yeah. and in which Cody uh, was involved. Uh, so they recruit Hickok for Scouts of the Plains. He only lasted a few months on stage. He shot out the spotlight uh, during one performance because he didn't like all the light. And that was pretty much the end of his theatrical career. <sighs> so unfortunately for a while, Bill, uh, Bill he didn't uh, uh, do so well. Uh, but... Crucially, in 1883, uh, Buffalo Bill founded Buffalo's Bill, Bill's Wild West. And here I'm going to be spectacularly pedantic and point out it was not Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Everybody calls it that, but I had a graduate student once correct me on this, and I've never forgotten it. It was known as Buffalo Bill's Wild West, and people just refer to it. Well, that's Buffalo Bill's Wild West show with a small s, but... If, I've taught people nothing. I hope to have gotten that across. Uh, but this is when the West got mythologized. Uh, the standard acts in this show became the archetypes well into the movie era. Now, it was scrupulously accurate, or at least claimed to be, so much so that Sitting Bull actually appeared in it at one point. He definitely had... Uh, um, members of Indian tribes appear, uh, you know, as, as high as Sitting Bull himself. Uh, Calamity Jane appeared in it, and Annie Oakley appeared in it. So, again, these, these figures that we think... And this is a traveling show. Yeah, a traveling so. show. We'll get to that in a minute. But uh, it, in a way, was the invention of rodeo, that what it did was demonstrate all these skills associated with the Wild West. So sharpshooting was a big deal, and that was Calamity Jane and Annie Oakley, uh, uh, roping calves, uh, horsemanship. Uh, it was an outdoor show uh, and drew upon all these skills, but it also staged many of the things that we now associate 
with the Wild West. There'd be a Pony Express Act demonstrating the exchange of horses in a row. Uh, uh, there were Indian attacks on wagon trains. Uh, there were stagecoach robberies. In fact, the, the big climax event for many years was the Deadwood stage mm. being attacked by robbers. Uh, and that's, you know, Deadwood, the gold mining camp, and the, the stage was carrying the gold. And, and it, by the way, it was the authentic stage. Uh, Buffalo Bill bought it after it was no longer used in Deadwood when the trains came in. Uh, and so he could claim, I've got the authentic uh, Deadwood stagecoach here. Uh, it's rumored that he staged Custer's Last Stand at one point, but that's not uh, <laughs> proven. Uh, there'd be train robberies. His big climax act for many years was the attack on the burning cabin. Um, Indians would surround a cabin and uh, fire flaming arrows at it, uh, and then just when it looked really bad for our, our, our uh, cabin dwellers, Buffalo Bill would arrive with the cavalry. So that scene of the cavalry coming to people's rescue, that goes back to Buffalo Bill. Now again, it probably goes back to some real life events, but right. he was the one who staged it. Now to give you an idea of the scale of this operation, <coughs> in 1887 he took the act to London. Now this is the 50th Jubilee year, Queen Victoria, big time in England. Uh, uh, he brought with him uh, uh, 200 performers, 180 horse horses, 18 buffaloes, and 10 elk uh, in this act. And it was just a huge deal. It appeared at Earl's Court Exhibition, which is still in London, at least the last time I looked. Uh, it was an outdoor event. Uh, uh, the the theater held forty thousand people, so it was a it was a huge. Uh, in a couple of months, he sold two million dollars in tickets, which is a lot of money. Back then, for, that's uh, when million uh, dollars really uh, went. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Went, uh, it was worth uh, something. And he spent forty thousand dollars on the backdrops alone, and it was it was very cinematic. Uh, most people don't realize there were many attempts at moving pictures in the 19th century that culminated with Edison inventing the motion picture uh, camera, but there uh, these things called panoramas. There were all, people craved moving pictures in the 19th century, and the idea is that there'd be enormous, almost Albert Bierstadt-like uh, backdrops of the mountains and the prairies, uh, and it... It sounds silly to us, but it struck people as very realistic. Yeah. They really thought they were seeing uh, the Wild West. He th uh, then went on in 1889 to Europe. Uh, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm attended one of the shows, and I love this. In 1890, he met Pope Leo XIII. I mean, this is the biggest thing in Europe when he showed up. Um, uh, he did, he he turned down an offer to perform it in the Colosseum. That that that's in, in Rome. That would have been something. That, uh, uh, it would have been very Roman Colosseum like, yeah. except they would have had people really have to die then. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but anyway, you can see from this uh, uh, the the uh, the creation of everything we think of as movie cliches. Uh, and there's a direct line uh, from Buffalo Bill's Wild West to the early uh, Hollywood movies. Uh, the one other example I'll talk about briefly is Wyatt Earp. Uh, uh, probably the most famous uh, <coughs> uh, Western marshal. Uh, it turns out he has an absolutely fascinating life. For one thing, he was born in 1848, didn't die till 1929. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, and it just, we, since so much of what we consider the Wild West dates from the 1870s and 80s, we have to remember these people lived into the 20th century. Uh, uh, Earp had a fascinating, and I'll say politely, checkered career. Uh, he wasn't a lawman for most of his life. In fact, he was largely a gambler and brothel keeper, uh, uh, as it turns out. Uh, and... Uh, uh, what is interesting, though, is he ended up in Hollywood, and this is what's so surprising. Uh, 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 moved to Los Angeles, 
uh, and around 1915, uh, he got hired as a consultant on Western movies. Now, part of it was that he intruded himself upon this world. Uh, he was very concerned uh, with establishing and cleaning up his reputation. I was very surprised to discover this. At around 1915, uh, he was uh, most famous uh, for having fixed a heavyweight championship bout. Well, I mean, this is just, that I did this, not. Yeah, no, I didn't really, and it's a famous, famous fight. Bob Fitzsimmons against Tom Sharkey, 1896. Uh, it was a heavyweight championship. It would have been the fight of the year. Uh, and although Fitzsimmons was winning, Earp was refereeing the bout and charged Fitzsimmons with a low blow and awarded the fight to Sharkey. Uh, and this was like the... Uh, 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 Sonny listed Ali fight yeah, right. became legend, and and Earp was vilified uh, for having taken a bribe to fix this fight, which he may well have done. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, this is, that's the, no one had heard of the OK Corral at this point, and so Earp was determined to uh, uh, establish a good reputation for himself. Uh, he became famous. Uh, with both Tom Mix and William Hart, who were the two most famous Western actors in Hollywood at the time. He became friends with John Ford at this time, Ford who was already working on silent uh, Westerns, uh, and he kept trying to tell people, make a movie about me. Uh, uh, Raoul Walsh was one of the guys who had talk, talking to making a, a gunfight at the OK Corral. Uh, movie. Uh, the first gunfight the OK Corral film uh, was called Law and Order, and that's 1932, and starred Walter Houston. Uh, but it's, it's Ford's uh, My Darling Clementine that's the first really famous gunfight at the OK Corral. Uh, by the way, the gunfight took place on Fremont Street. Uh, it did not take place in the OK Corral. Uh, it's sad to learn all these things as you study uh, uh, the matter. Uh, uh, now, uh, finally, it, he tried to get one guy, I think, named John Flood to write a biography of him, but it was so badly written, no one published it. Finally, uh, a guy named Stuart Lake uh, published a book called Wyatt Earp Frontier Marshall in 1931, and that's what made him famous as a good guy. And that's just after his death. Uh, just after his death. Right. Uh, uh, Lake did interview him, uh, and the interesting thing is that Evidently, Earp's wife was present at these interviews and kept cutting out things like the brothel stories, uh, possibly because she was a prostitute herself in her earlier days. Uh, and now, she was named Josephine Sarah Marcus, but known as Sadie, and also known uh, as many, by many, uh, many other names, uh, evidently. Uh, she was Jewish. Uh, she was uh, Herb's third wife, though they were never married, but they lived together for 46 years. Uh, and so as a result of all this, uh, uh, Wyatt Earp is buried in a Jewish cemetery uh, in Coma, California, just south of San Francisco, in the Hills of Eternity Cemetery. Now, who would have guessed right. that, that Wyatt Earp is buried in a Jewish cemetery? Uh, but she, uh, uh, Josephine lived, I think, until the 1940s. Uh, so uh, here's a case where he basically worked very hard at creating the legends about himself. Now, to put this in some perspective, uh, Earp and his brothers were put on trial for murder after the gunfight at O.K. Corral. They were acquitted, uh, but it was very highly contested. And by the way, it was a partisan trial. It was Republicans versus Democrats in this town, with the Republicans defending Earp and the Democrats attacking him. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 there were very conflicting accounts. Some TV show restaged the event and took Earp's side. The question is whether they shot unarmed men. Right. Uh, <clears throat> and some people claim they did, and the Earps claim they didn't. And, the forensic evidence seems to show uh, that Billy Clanton uh, could not uh, have been shot when he was down. A anyway, uh, just to show there's controversy uh, about it. Uh, but here's a man who worked hard in Hollywood, in Hollywood, uh, dealing with 
directors, actors, uh, 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 Nixon Hart were pallbearers at his funeral in 1929. Hmm. So the fact that we think of Wyatt Earp as this great hero. Now, I loved Wyatt. I love That's one of my favorite shows on TV, you, you O'Brien and Wyatt Earp. But it's painful for me to say, therefore, that it, it may be that this is all invented. But invented by Wyatt Earp, that's what I love about it. Right. Uh, so that's what I mean when I say the Western was self-mythologized. These guys, it's very much creating their own image. Uh, and they didn't have press agents. They pretty much did it themselves. And my impression is, and I've taught this once ages ago, the, the novel The Virginian by Owen Wister, which I think is 1903 or something like 1902, that. 1902, I checked that. 1902, yeah. yeah. And he was a Philadelphia aristocratic type, I believe, a friend of Teddy Roosevelt. And I think it was pretty, and that was maybe the high culture invention of the Western, I think. Yes. This is, he was a pretty serious novelist. And that was a very self, as I recall, self-conscious effort to uh, create a myth for Americans as they entered the 20th century and a life where you couldn't do this anymore. That it was sort of, you, you had to have these virtue, you couldn't, the Virginia ends with civilization, with the West vanishing, the imminent uh, end of the West. That's the sort of melancholy, happy but melancholy ending of the justice prevails, but justice prevails, so there won't be a man like the Virginian in the future. And it's, it seems to be to try to teach Americans that you need to have these virtues even though you can't actually go shoot the bad guy anymore, you know, even though we're going to be in a civilized bourgeois world. It's, an inter it's interesting how nostalgic the Western is yes. in its origin almost, which is sort of unusual, or it seems yes. unusual, and you, I mean, <laughs> and, in a way and true of the popular version you're you, talking about too. Yeah, it's sort you, of, you see why people, uh, Wyatt Earp was nostalgic in the 19, 1950. Right. Buffalo Bill got nostalgic. But even in the 1870s yeah, yeah, and 80s, yeah. These people they're... Mythologizing something that's also still happening. I mean, yeah. Custer's like, you yeah. know, uh, City Bot Bull is, you know, you know. Buffalo, Buffalo Bill has shot the last remaining buffalo, almost. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, and so uh, uh, these people saw their way of life was disappearing and they wanted to leave a memorial of this. Another example would be Frederick Jackson Turner's famous essay, The Closing of the American Frontier. Uh, most people think he was lamenting the closing of the American I think it's 1890 or something. It's something, Ish. 90s, there are various versions of it. Yeah. Uh, most people think he was lamenting the closing. He wasn't. He was no, celebrating. He was a progressive, I he think. He was a yeah. Wilsonian progressive. Yeah, yeah this is the and past. Yeah, this right. a, we need the administrated world. This was too lawless. Right. Uh, uh, and so uh, that's why, again, I think the Western is fascinating because it allows us to think about American history and this actual important turning point and how it got mythologized. And I think you're right, the Teddy Roosevelt types, and by the way, Teddy and Roosevelt himself yeah. just came out west and wrote yeah. a lot of volumes about it. Yeah, right? and you and saw uh, 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 Bullock in, uh, Seth Bullock, in the character in Deadwood, uh, the one that Timothy Oliphant played. Uh, so uh, the uh, 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 people like Roosevelt, thought we were entering the 20th century uh, and we can't have this lawlessness anymore. But that, we want some of those virtues. Yes. Man, you know, kind of manliness. Uh, you know, yes. Uh, and by the way, that was very much the way the Western was perceived in Victorian England. They were very much afraid that they were losing their manliness. The imperial uh, ex escapades had been an attempt to recapture, but they got very worried that America was surpassing them. And they, there was all these accounts, they'd look at Buffalo Bill hmm. and say a new specimen is evolving and how are we gonna fight guys like this? Hmm. Uh, 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 so uh, it's why the Western is so interesting to study, to see the, this stuff worked out. And so, you know, the greatest example of the Western is John Ford. And, so let's uh, get to the movies, which I suppose yeah. for post-1930 or so is the way in which the, the Western yeah, and, lives. Yeah, you know, in some uh, ways it's the best way for it to live. I will say this for the Western that, uh, you know, I confess I haven't read The Virginian. I will read it eventually, yeah. but I think it works so much better on film. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, again, it's, I should say that the Western had huge worldwide success uh, in the form of the novel. Right. Uh, so much so that Europeans started imitating this. Uh, German author Karl May was writing Westerns in German already in the 19th century, and they were very popular. And he never uh, in the early 20th century. I think he was like the most popular yeah. I author think in was, Germany yes. for some stretch there yes. at the beginning of the century, uh, of the 20th century. 
And I think he'd never set foot right, in the right. West. Yeah. <laughs> he just uh, like, yeah, read, <laughs> read accounts and wrote them up in German. Franz Kafka wrote a novel, America, and he'd never, oh, and it sure. ends up in the Wild West in Oklahoma. Uh, in a kind of, so it's just amazing how this stuff captured the European imagination. And, and above all, Ford, uh, 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 again, uh, 1939 Stagecoach, which is generally considered... So Ford lives from... I don't know what he's born, but I mean, so he's already a producer in oh, the he was silent... Making film, yes, yes. He, director in the yeah, silent mo- Many of the films have been lost, but he, he... I think he did about 140 films. So he's well time. into his... Uh, prime of his career by yes, the 30s yes. and so forth. Uh, and fam- already sort of famous? I mean, Yes, yes. Yeah. And then uh, the fact that he made Stagecoach in a way shocked people because at that point westerns were thought of as B-movies. Uh, and he chose this B-movie star, some guy named John Wayne, to appear in Stagecoach and uh, the rest is cinematic history. Uh, he made... Uh, as so I Stagecoach met- is the one that puts the Western movie yes, on the, the map as a... Y- yes, and it was a more very... more than just B-movies that they show two at a time. In, right, because it was uh, it's very much a uh, late depression era film. The stagecoach is a social microcosm. It brings together from d- people from different social classes, uh, and there's a kind of nostalgic figure from the Old South. There's a banker who represents all the evils of big business and depression. There's a prostitute. There's John Wayne, who's a kind of outlaw. Uh, uh, it, and again, it, it is all about the oppressiveness of the modern small town, the moral oppressiveness of it, uh, the way this prostitute is treated uh, with great contempt, and the dream is to escape to Mexico at the end, to a ranch in Mexico. Uh, uh, and so it's, it's a, you know, most people think of the Western as a conservative genre. Uh, I think that's completely wrong. It's a product of the fact that the two most famous Western stars, John Wayne and Clint Eastwood, were conservative in their political beliefs. Uh, but uh, the films the better ones are usually critical of America in one way or another and really lament uh, the way the world is going. Uh, Ford made, 1946, made My Darling Clementine, which is the first uh, really good movie about the gunfight at O.K. Corral. Uh, uh, And where I think it picks up that name in popular culture, uh, uh, he made his famous Cavalry Trilogy that's Fort Apache, 1948, She wore Yellow Ribbon, 1949, uh, and Rio Grande, 1950, all with John Wayne. And for example, Fort Apache is a deconstruction of the Custer legend. Mm. Uh, uh, right there already in 48, uh, Henry Fonda plays a very thinly veiled uh, uh, Custer, uh, and he's presented as vain, narcissistic, irresponsible. Uh, it, 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 Henry Fonda. Uh, 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 people pl- say he played his first villain in Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in the West. No, he's the villain in that film. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, John Wayne plays this guy named York, uh, who represents the right way to deal with the Indians and and Fonda treats them with contempt and lets himself be drawn with this battle where he and all his soldiers are wiped out. Uh, Now, it's an interesting touch. Uh, Fonda's character is named Owen Thursday, and and John Wayne as York is asked to speak at his funeral, and he lies about him. Hmm. He lies about what a great man Owen Thursday was. So although John Ford is deconstructing the Custer legend, he won't allow it to occur during the film. And so this is the theme uh, that's With famous. The film is self-conscious about yes, the about, lying. I mean, yes, it's, it's about really, the legends. So yeah, speak. no, yeah. it's amazing how self-conscious yeah. this film is. That's 1948. That isn't postmodernism. Right. Uh, and of course, it's you know maybe we'll get to talk about Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, but. Uh, you know, the famous line in that film, uh, when the uh, legend becomes fact, print the legend. Yeah. Uh, and it's really interesting how many uh, films about the West recognize the mythologizing of the West. Uh, 
uh, Eastwood's Unforgiven is another example of that. Uh, but here it is, as early as 1948, uh, and it's Custer. I think the there's an Errol Flynn, Custer's Last Stand movie, around the same time, and it's the whole legend and how wonderful Custer was. And, uh, uh, so uh, Ford was a very intelligent man, very aware of legends. Uh, they were expendable as a World War II film that debunks the MacArthur myth in an extraordinary way. They were expendable. All these guys who were saving MacArthur mm -hmm. getting around the Pacific, but they were expendable. Uh, uh, anyway, but let's talk about The Searchers. Which this is, is, is his greatest film, and I think, you know, one of, one of 20 films that I would call the 10 greatest films right. of all time. Uh, it's 1954. It's Wayne's greatest performance. Uh, it has all the extraordinary characters of Ford's film, above all the use of landscape, the terrific uh, visions of Monument Valley in it. And that's, Ford was so great at revealing the setting of the Western on that frontier line between civilization and barbarism. It shows you a, a world that is hostile to human nature and where people are literally scraping out a living uh, on these farms. Uh, and it, uh, uh, Wayne plays uh, Ethan Edwards, uh, uh, who is a Civil War veteran. veteran. You see his gray coat, uh, for example. Uh, and he is the perfect Western hero in the sense that he's tough, he's unrelenting, he's implacable, he's good with a gun, uh, he's a scout, uh, he knows how to track, uh, he knows the ways of the Indians, uh, uh, and uh, he is what is defending these frontier communities there are these perfectly decent and ordinary people trying to eke out a living uh, uh, on these prairie farms uh, and barely surviving, and then they have these Indians attacking them, and the film is based on the fact that uh, the, the family of uh, uh, Wayne's character uh, is wiped out by an Indian raid, and one of the uh, daughters is uh, uh, kidnapped and uh, adopted by the tribe, and uh, Wayne has to set out to avenge these deaths and to uh, bring back the daughter, although we soon figure out he wants to kill her uh, because she's turned. She's now an Indian uh, and not, uh, not a white woman. Uh, now, this has made the movie exceedingly politically correct, pol politically incorrect today, uh, and uh, uh, it's not quite in the category of birth of a nation, but you can see that uh, critics today have a hard time calling it a great film uh, because of what they perceive to be Ethan's racism in the film. And it is amazing the degree to which he's called a villain now mm. in film criticism. Uh, uh, I mean, it's John Wayne, come on. Uh, uh, and uh, here's a point where I feel my background in Shakespeare and so-called serious literature is an advantage. I, I think many critics of popular culture, uh, not to be offensive, uh, are lacking in certain critical skills that you develop in talking about Shakespeare. And above all, uh, I lament the absence of the concept of tragic hero in much of the criticism of popular culture. Uh, it's a point I discovered when I was writing on The Searchers. and uh, That is, uh, for many critics, the only alternative to hero is villain. And if you can show that a certain character is not nice, then he's a villain. Uh, and I invoke the example of Macbeth. Macbeth is the hero of Macbeth. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not called Macduff. Mm -hmm. It's not called Malcolm, it's called Macbeth. Uh, it's a very nasty man. He kills a lot of people, kills children. Uh, don't do these things at home. It's only a play. But he's the hero of the play, and he's a tragic hero. And Shakespeare, generally speaking, shows heroes who do terrible things. Uh, Othello murders his wife on the most absurd evidence of her having committed adultery. Uh, Hamlet kills half the characters of the play. 
And this is what Shakespeare understood by a tragic hero. The hero's tragic because there's something heroic about him. He's an extraordinary human being, does things that ordinary people can't do, but for one reason or another, and that's the core of the play, uh, he ends up doing terrible things. Uh, this goes back to Homer. Achilles did terrible, terrible things. He was a nasty, nasty man. Uh, guy crawls in front of him, asking not to be killed, and Achilles kills him and drags him around Troy behind his chariot for three days. Talks about wanting to eat his flesh. A nasty man, Achilles, but a great hero. Uh, uh, and that's John Wayne in, in The Searchers, and I just, you know, I, I can't you read these people? Yes, there's some terrible things about Ethan Edwards. Uh, 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 he's a very cruel uh, man, but you need this guy. There are times when you need him. When the Indians are circ just about to attack the cabin, the little boy says, uh, they're getting nervous, if only Uncle Ethan were here. And the answer is, for Uncle Heath, Ethan were there, these Indians would be dead. Uh, and so this is the terrible fact about living on the frontier, uh, that there aren't police you can call. There's no 911 number you can call up. There's no institution there to save you. Uh, and so what saves you uh, is this very heroic and skillfully heroic man. And, of course, you know, the... Um, uh, it is a modern movie. He does not kill little, little Debbie when he's the opportunity. No. There's this moment where you can see his eyes. He's about to do it. And then he, he looks at her, and that's little Debbie. And he, he can't kill her. Uh, uh, and, you know, that's the difference between the Iliad uh, and even Shakespearean tragedy. Uh, but I think The Searchers comes as close to tragedy uh, as a modern film can come. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, at the end of the film, uh, yes, uh, Wayne brings uh, little Debbie back home, but he cannot enter to the house anymore. And this is this great John Ford shot where he's framed by the doorway and re retreats into the distance. And this is the tragedy of the Western hero. He cannot become part of the community which he saved uh, and which he was necessary to save. Uh, and so that's what's so interesting to me about the Western, that it just raised this whole world uh, of Homeric style heroism, which, as you say, is perceived as part of the past or receding into the past, but it gives you a tremendous appreciation of what it stood for uh, and what a heroic figure uh, this guy was. And there's, <coughs> there's this feeling uh, they were giants in those days. And I suppose... Sotto voce, so to speak, the movies suggest maybe that maybe these virtues might still be necessary because maybe our bourgeois world isn't quite as secure as you think, and there are right. still and, and, and the, threats. And, right, and, and then the background is subtle. Uh, yeah, background is you know Ford was making World War II movies around this time, and of course uh, uh, in Rio Grande, it's the Korean War is in the background of that film. It's all about crossing the border into Mexico to eliminate some uh, outlaws. Mm. And it was the whole question of the Korean War, do we cross the parallel? Yeah. Uh, and so yes, I think it's very much, um, uh, Ford is a great admirer of military heroism. And you know he was broken hearted that he couldn't serve in World War II, but he became a cameraman and made these wonderful films of Midway, for example. Uh, so yes, there's a, and you know, there's this whole Cold War atmosphere in the '50s films uh, uh, that we can't afford to lose these heroic types like John Wayne. Of course, John Wayne felt strongly oh, that right. way too. So the Searchers is '54. Yeah. And then the man who shot Liberty Valley is sixty-two. Was that late, okay. yeah. So that's considered the end of. The yes, movie. and that's self-consciously so. The whole film was retrospective. Uh, you know, this is a kind of argument I don't like to make myself. But pe the film looks awfully cheesy. It is obviously made on a Hollywood set, and there are no great scenes in Monument Valley. And critics say that was deliberate. Hmm. Uh, that. Ford wanted to evoke 
the mythic quality of all of this. Which is explicitly the yeah. topic of the movie. I mean, yeah, yes. Yeah, so, 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 so that's kind I, of interesting. I yeah. don't like this kind of argument because I wonder, was the budget just low? Yeah, right, and it, right. uh, This is what uh, you're trying to make an argument, really in a sense, make a virtue out of necessity. But, you know, there's some truth to that, that you can see this is a movie set. You can actually recognize it from, like, uh, TV Westerns. Uh, uh, and so that tells you a lot about the film. Uh, and, you know, the whole movie is Jimmy Stewart versus John Wayne. Jimmy Stewart plays, I think his name is Rand Stoddard. Uh, he's come to uh, this little uh, uh, western town, an Eastner. He's brought his law books with him. He's going to practice law. And then this... Uh, outlaw uh, Liberty Valance, who's played by uh, 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 Jack Palance. Uh, yeah, Jack Palance. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, he beats, uh, he robs the stage and beats up the Jimmy Stewart character. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Stewart goes ahead and tries to practice law. The town's called Shinbone, gets involved in state politics. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, he ends up having to have a gunfight with the Lee Marvin character, and he appears to shoot him and kill right. him. Turns out in a flashback that it was the John Wayne character, uh, Tom Donovan, uh, who shot him with a rifle from afar. Uh, but on the basis of being the man who shot Liberty Valance, uh, the Jimmy Stewart character has this wonderful political career, culminating becomes senator. And in the film, it begins with him coming back to Shinbone with his wife uh, to uh, 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 just, you know, uh, revisit his roots. Uh, and the whole story emerges in flashback, which is perfect, because the idea, the Western is in the past. The story is in the past. Uh, and again, Wayne plays uh, the typical Western hero, uh, aggressive, uh, good with a gun, uh, uh, willing to stand up uh, for people's rights. Uh, Jimmy Stewart's character, uh, frankly, appears effeminate in the film. There's one scene where he appears with an apron. He's working in a restaurant. It's very self-conscious on, on, on Ford's part. And he's showing that, uh, yeah, it's the Jimmy Stewart types who won. Uh, you know, the film begins with a shot of a railroad pulling into town, and that's the symbol of civilization and the railroad leading it. And we, we learn that uh, Tom Donovan was in love with the woman Jimmy Stewart, eventually married, uh, and she fell in love with Jimmy Stewart's uh, character. And it is all about how the heroic, Homeric, aristocratic world of the West was replaced by this modern middle class uh, world where the lawyer dominates. I mean, again, it couldn't be more symbolic that his law books triumph over John Wayne's guns. Uh, uh, only because film. of John Wayne's guns. Yes. Triumph yeah. over the yeah. bad guys because of John yeah. Wayne's. Yeah. Which is this, which John Wayne keeps, which everyone keeps secret. Yes. Uh, I mean, Wayne never says that he. Yes, he he will not ruin this guy's career. Of course, at the and end. Does Stewart know that it was Wayne who shot him? Uh, yes, he yes. eventually finds out. Yeah. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, Wayne has to convince Stewart to stay in politics, and he tells him the story. And of course, the, the, towards the very end of the film, uh, uh, the local newspaper man has been interviewing uh, the Jimmy Stewart character, uh, uh, and uh, he admits all these things. And and Stewart says, "Okay, you got your story now." And he says, "I'm not going to print it." And that's when he says, "When the legend becomes the fact, print the legend." And again, it shows you how self-conscious Ford was uh, was about the myth of the West and why it, you know, in a way it's ideal. It has to be preserved, but you also have to reveal the extent to which it is a myth. Uh, uh, so, I mean, again, I think that this is why Ford is, is the greatest uh, maker of Westerns. Again, I think The Searchers is the greatest of them, but Man Who Shot Literary Valance is not far behind. It's really interesting. There's a lot about politics in it. There's this in incredible uh, 
there's a, a, a school and uh, the uh, uh, local African American wants to go to school and get learned, learned and Jimmy Stewart is teaching about U.S. politics. Uh, do any of you know a line from the U.S. Constitution and Pompey, the black man, says, all men are created equal. Yeah, so it's a great Harry Jaffa moment. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, that the Declaration underlies the Constitution. I guess, it's just amazing how intelligent some of these films become uh, in that you know, way. What strikes me also is uh, a little bit is, so I guess in 39, let's say, the uh, which is the, the uh, stagecoach, which yeah. is considered the sort of the height of the wet, the unironic Western, yeah, I guess yeah. you'd say. Yeah. It's only a quarter, less than a quarter century later the one has the man who shot Liberty Valance, and before that, I guess Shane, which is also yes, Shane self-consciously is also nostalgic and uh, not definitely, quite ironic, it's but the, I mean, at the end, and also uh, High Noon, which is also yeah. so. I mean, it's, it's like both. The, it's so quick that they went from yes, apparently uh, unironic to the not ironic is quite the right word, but what would you say well, the the unmask the myth and the unmasking of the myth yeah. are almost contemporaneous, right? I mean, uh, genres move very fast. This is something people do not understand. Uh, if you see 1590 is the beginning of the Elizabethan theater, uh, let's say Renaissance theater, uh, by 1615, it's almost over. By 1630, it's gone. Now, of course, it's become Jacobean and Carol, so on, but, 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 uh, 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 Genres establish cliches, and people start making fun of the cliches very quickly. Uh, 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 Romeo and Juliet is about 1596. Uh, John Ford, the other John Ford, the, re the Renaissance playwright John Ford, wrote a play called Tis Pity She's a Whore, I think around 1630. It's the Romeo and Juliet story, except they're brother and sister. And you see, people are bored with the Romeo and Juliet story, the two youngsters rebelling against the parents. And, and uh, Tis Pity She's a Whore, it has a nurse in it, it has a friar, there's all the things from Romeo and Juliet, except the hero and heroine are brother and sister. And that gives it a new charge. It's amazing play about incest, written in 1630 or so. But it's, that's the logic of a genre. You know, how many times can you retell the Romeo and Juliet story? Uh, and indeed, the the uh, the no uh, the notion of the revisionist Western that somehow Westerns were fundamentally transformed in the 1960s and 70s. No, there are revisionist rest Westerns being written almost from almost right. from the beginning. Uh, uh, and again, High Noon would be another example of that. Uh, the Oxbow incident in the four and forties. It's a popular genre. It attracts talented people. That's my point about popular culture, and also that it moves very fast. Uh, 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 so to go on from here, yeah. I'd like to take a trip around the world. Okay. Now, uh, Do you want to talk about Clint Eastwood for a minute, though? First, uh, I'm going to get to Clint okay. Eastwood, but I got to go to Japan okay. and then to Italy. Okay. And this, to me, is a fascinating uh, point about the uh, uh, Western. Uh, that it became an international form. And again, you see it in people like Karl May, that when the Western was popular as a literary form, it was picked up in Europe uh, and adapted from there. And similarly, there's this strange journey of the Western uh, from John Ford to Akira Kurosawa uh, to Sergio Leone and then back to Clint Eastwood. And again, I offer this as a kind of case study in popular culture, how it's globalized, and again, how fast it works. Now, Akira Kurosawa, uh, you know, uh, one of the 10, five greatest directors of all time, uh, and certainly uh, a master of the samurai film, uh, but uh, he very much developed out of John Ford. Now, part of it is just cinematic, he learned how to do these incredible wide shots uh, from Ford. If you Google John Ford and Akira Kurosawa, this semi-pedantic guy comes up, uh, shows you his scene from Drums Along the Mohawk and from The Hidden Fortress by Kurosawa, Drums Along the Mohawk, of course, by John Ford, and it's uh, guys raising a flag. It's the same scene. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing uh, to see it. In general, uh, Kurosawa admitted how much he learned in terms of cinematography from watching Ford's films. Uh, and he uh, uh, merged uh, the American Western with the samurai film. 
And it's very interesting to see how he was able to do it because the underlying situations were so much the same. Here I'm thinking most famously of Seven Samurai. Let's see, the date on that is 1954, so actually same time as the searches, but uh, uh, Kurosawa had been watching earlier uh, Ford movies. Uh, uh, the uh, samurai movies, well, samurai, uh, they're these aristocratic warriors in the right. Japanese tradition. And these films are generally set uh, during the Tokugawa Shogunate. Uh, it starts, I think, in the 16th century and ends in 1868 with the Meiji Restoration. This, this is the period in which uh, Japan was in a kind of prolonged civil war uh, where these great daimyo, these uh, feudal lords, we'd call them. Yeah, feudalism is yeah, maybe the closest yeah, yeah, analogy it's a period, in our, yeah. yeah, and it's very interesting to see. I mean, uh, uh, Kurosawa was uh, obsessed with feudalism. Uh, it didn't end in some ways until 1868. Uh, uh, up until that point, for hundreds of years, the shogun uh, was effectively ruling Japan and the emperor was a figurehead, kind of religious figure. I think the emperor it was in Edo, which is now Tokyo, and the, the shogun was in Kyoto. Uh, and the shogun was a warlord, kind of generalissimo. He was the most powerful militarily of feudal lords. and. This begins with Eiyasu Tokugawa. Uh, by the way, this is one of the reasons why Kurosawa made the best Shakespeare films mm -hmm. in the 20th century. Throne of Blood, which is based on Macbeth, and Ron, which is based on King Lear. As <coughs> Shakespeare was dealing in his history plays with the emergence of modern centralized kingship out of the feudal era uh, uh, in medieval uh, England, and it maps perfectly onto feudal uh, uh, Japan, and feudalism in Japan was a lot like the Wild West, as, as uh, uh, Kurosawa saw it, and he particularly liked dealing with the figure of the ronin, who was a masterless samurai, because this was the situation, you would have these feudal clans battling it out, in many cases one of the feudal lords were ki ki was killed, and then his samurai were released from their loyalty, and indeed had no one to serve. Uh, so the Ronin becomes the great figure uh, in uh, uh, Kurosawa's films. Uh, the Seven Samurai uh, is based on a situation where these unemployed samurai go to work for a little village to protect them from another feudal lord. And in, in general, uh, these Kurosawa films deal uh, with an unemployed samurai uh, who serves for pay uh, some master. And so it's like the hired gun in the American West. It's like the Johnny Ringo uh, figure. Of course, these figures, they were portrayed by Toshiro Mifune, the John Wayne of the samurai film. Uh, uh, and Seven Samurai is about these great warriors uh, who are trying to protect these villages against rampaging uh, other warriors and who have to train them uh, and they can't individually stand up to a samurai because a samurai like Coriolanus can kill 40 ordinary people with no problem. But when they band together and learn trickery, they're able to trap these outlaws in various ways. And then they have people like Toshiro Mufuni standing up for them. And so they end up defeating uh, the, uh, uh, the bad guys. Uh, but what we see is the villagers have their village, and they've won their village, but the samurai are still unemployed at the end. And at the end, one of them says, they won, we lost. Uh, and it's the same vision. Mm of these heroic men who've lost the core of their existence, which was a feudal system, and are now fighting uh, for pay uh, uh, and for no long-term purpose. Now, of course, it's fascinating that Seven Samurai was then remade into a Western, The Magnificent Seven by John Sturgis. And let me put in a plug for John Sturgis. I think he's terribly underrated. He did Bad Day at Black Rock, the Magnificent Seven, and Gunfight the OK Corral, which I think is the best Gunfight OK Corral movie. Stars uh, uh, Burt Lancaster uh, as Wyatt Earp and, and 
Kirk Douglas uh, in a career-making performance as Doc Holliday. Uh, uh, and Jack Elam, I think, is Johnny Ringo. But anyway, it's a great film. People say it's just a derivative from Ford, but I think it's better than that. But anyway, just to put it to play, that was my favorite Western as a kid. When I saw my darling uh, Clementine, my reaction was, it's pretty good, but it's no gunfight. Right. Don't kick her out. But anyway, but it's fascinating that this Japanese film, Seven Samurai, based on John Ford's movies, gets remade as an American Western and has been remade since. Uh, th there's this international circulation of this Western form, which I find fascinating. Uh, now, to continue the story, I'd love to talk about Kurosawa for, for an hour, but uh, he then goes on to make a film called Yojimbo and a sequel to it called Sanjuro. Yojimbo means bodyguard, and it's about a samurai who walks into a city, again, uh, an unemployed samurai, walks into a town where he realizes there's a feud going on, and he gradually offers himself to both sides and plays them off against each other, uh, which is a, a marvelous symbol of the chaos and anarchy that occurs during this Tokugawa shogunate. Uh, it's why the Meiji Restoration was necessary to restore the emperor to a central position. But <coughs> again, it's, it, 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 it's fascinating to see how in the 40s and 50s, uh, Kurosawa was trying to come to terms with World War II and the true end of the feudal spirit <coughs> in Japan because so much of it survived in the Bushido code uh, of the Japanese military it's what really had to be brought to an end. So he basically projects what was a real problem of his own time back into these early periods, and again, showing that <coughs> these aristocratic forms can survive in a democratic world. By the way, uh, this is the great theme of Katsu Ishiguro's novels. Uh, the, uh, he writes in English, but he's Japanese. Remains of the Day is all about this, that great novel about uh, pre-World War II England and the aspects of fascism in pre-World War II England, that's a projection uh, on Ishiguro's part of the Japanese situation onto a European model. Uh, so all these things circulate in so many com complex ways. Uh, uh, and then uh, Yojimbo becomes Fistful of Dollars, hmm. an Italian Western. Uh, with Clint Eastwood playing the Toshiro Mofuni part. So we've gone from John Wayne to Toshiro Mofuni uh, uh, to, to Clint Eastwood. That's how we get there. Uh, and Sergio Leone makes this uh, so-called Man With No Name trilogy. Let's see if I got the dates on that here. Fistful of Dollars, 1964. For a few dollars more is 1965. And The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly which, by the way, in the Italian is the good, the ugly, and the bad, uh, 1966. Uh, uh, and here's a whole new genre, we call it the Spaghetti Western, uh, in which uh, the, the uh, Western is transposed to an Italian director. The films were shot in Spain. Uh, there are areas of Spain that look a lot like Arizona, which is why the conquistadors locked Arizona when they got there, where they were from Estremadura, and it, <laughs> it looked like home to them. Like the Swedes went to Minnesota, uh, the Spanish went to Arizona and New Mexico. So it's extraordinary how much those films look like uh, there in the American West. And now I find it particularly interesting in Leone's case, he's an Italian, he now merges it with the mafia. That is, these are in a way crime dramas. They are really about outlaws, about kidnappers, about rape, rapists, about extortionists. I mean, the level of crime in these spaghetti westerns escalates to a whole new level of violence and malevolence, and I can't help thinking this is from a guy uh, who knows the mafia, and indeed, uh, Perhaps his two greatest films are Once Upon a Time in the West, which is 1968, and then Once Upon a Time in America, which is about gangsters in America. And so here's where the Western and the gangster movie merge hmm. in a fascinating way in Leone. Now, I should, I'm not a big fan of these Westerns, I have to say. 
They were not well reviewed when they were brought to the U.S. They were regarded as trashy films. Then, as often happens, the the people who go to cinema, not to movies, mm-hmm. discover these films and th- thought they were great. Uh, this is like Europe's revenge uh, 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 for Jerry Lewis. Uh, uh, Jerry Lewis, whose movies were received as brilliant works of art in France, and now eventually Sergio Leone's movies have been received as brilliant works of art in America. I recognize the cinematography. Uh, the Morricone musical scores are excellent. I can never get over the f- fact that the films are dubbed and yeah. badly dubbed. And more than half the actors are Italians, so they're not even speaking the language. But even, uh, you know, Eastwood does a great job, but it, it's noticeably dubbed. There was no shooting on location in the films, and it's just so obviously dubbed like a bad Hercules movie. Uh, uh, and, you know, to Eli Wallach in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly is playing this Mexican bandit. It's kind of like Al Pacino in Scarface. It's this phony Spanish accent. Anyway, so I, I'll get in a lot of trouble if I don't proclaim these the greatest movies. They, they, they show up on lists of greatest is movies. Is that right? Yeah. But it's, originally they were regarded as sort of absolute schlocky, tra- right? Yeah, yeah. They were, you know, we were getting all these Sword and Sandals movies from Dino De Laurentiis. Uh, Kirk Douglas again as Ulysses, but but uh, and you know it was I, I don't know, I think they paid Eastwood fifteen thousand dollars for the first film. He was their third choice. Uh, I think they wanted Charles Bronson actually, oh, right. uh, uh, and then they went for Richard Harris and he recommended Eastwood. And Eastwood is great in them. And he's proven to be a great actor. You know, I, I mean, he has one of the great careers in Hollywood history as both an actor and as a director. And this taught him everything he needed to know. He would learned from Sergio Leone and then from Don Siegel as a, a director. But still, uh, the movies themselves are kind of tacky and cheesy in my view. But they re- these are the Hobbesian Westerns. These are the films that in which there's uh, there's absolutely nothing redeeming in y- human nature, and in which it is a war of all against all, and and life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, uh, again, there are there are memorable shots uh, in them, but you know the landscape is entirely barren. It's as if the town is set in Monument Valley. Right. You know, there's no greenery. There's, uh, the town doesn't belong there. And indeed, it doesn't survive. It's just blown away eventually uh, uh, by these villains. And it's very hard to tell the heroes from the villains. Uh, uh, so again, I'm, I'm not a big fan of these films. But they do play an important part. And again, this amazing story of the, the, the Western migrating west to Japan, then to Italy, and then Eastwood bring it back uh, to the United States. Uh, he appeared in a film called Hang 'em High in 1968, which he did not direct. Uh, uh, but then uh, High Plains Drifter, 1973, uh, which is my favorite of uh, his Westerns up until Unforgiven essentially playing the same character. But this is, he comes to this town, it's entirely corrupt. Uh, they're having an outlaw problem. He offers himself to solve it. Again, he's Yojimbo. Uh, he, he's the masterless samurai. Uh, uh, and he turns out he just wants to see the town destroyed. It's not clear. He may be a supernatural figure. Uh, he may have been killed, and this is his ghost coming back to get revenge. But it's pure revenge and pure violence. Uh, it's it's highly stylized, and I think done well. And he's he he acts very well. And again, the point of the film is to expose everybody's corrupt. Uh, the mayor, the police chief. Uh, uh, John John Wayne actually criticized Eastwood publicly for this view of the West that you know this John Wayne wanted to find something heroic in it. And all of this culminates in Unforgiven. Uh, let's see, that's 1992. Uh, and that I'd rank up there with the searchers. You know, again, I feel some of these films, they're, they're not just the greatest westerners, but they're among the greatest films of all time. Uh, uh, and Unforgiven, again, has this strongly nostalgic aspect to it. And again, we, um, Eastwood is well into his career. I think he's feeling too old to play Western parts anymore. They are physically demanding. It's so similar to what happened to John Wayne towards the end of his career. 
uh, that Wayne started playing aging gunfighters at the end of their, his career at, uh, in one last heroic uh, uh, undertaking. Uh, by the way, Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch is a film like this. You start to get these last hurrah movies. Uh, the last hurrah of the outlaw. Uh, 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 Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid would be another example of that. And Unforgiven is about this guy named William Money, uh, long retired from his gunfighting days, uh, uh, just living a uh, bare existence on a farm with his two kids and um, uh, some prostitutes uh, in a town, I think in Wyoming, uh, uh, one of them was killed, and they put out a uh, bounty, and the, they were willing to offer a lot of money, and maybe it's five thousand uh, dollars, a lot of money back then, uh, for someone who killed them. And this young kid calls himself the Schofield Kid, approaches Billy Money to come uh, uh, help him uh, uh, win the bounty, and. Uh, uh, Money doesn't want to do it, but he needs the money, uh, perhaps something symbolic in his name. Uh, and he agrees to go to this town, which is presided over, uh, uh, presided over by Gene Hackman, Little Bob. And he's running a tough town. Uh, a guy named English Bob, I think played by Richard Harris, shows up, and, 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 and the Gene Hackman character beats him silly because he doesn't want gunfighters coming to his town. What's interesting is English Bob shows up with a reporter named Beecham uh, who's writing stories about English Bob. Uh, and so the film, again, gets very self-conscious. You see the creation of the legend within the film itself. And again, how phony it is, how, uh, how much English Bob is promoting himself. Uh, uh, and then Eastwood shows up, uh, again, gets into fights with everybody. Uh, uh, he, he's there with uh, Morgan Freeman is playing one of his friends named Logan, and the town kills Logan, and that's when money goes out for his revenge. And it culminates in a gunfight in a saloon, uh, which I find very interesting because it's entirely premised on how difficult it is to kill another human being. Uh, now, the unspoken premise of most Westerns is it's the easiest thing in the world to kill another human being, uh, which I don't think is true. I often wonder if there's any circumstances in which I would be able to do it, and not because I consider myself a particularly moral person, but I just don't think I'd have the courage to do it. And of course, in, you know, in the army, you have to learn to do it in combat, but you're usually very far away. Uh, uh, I guess there is hand-to-hand -hand combat, but that's the point about the Western, particularly as the Western gunfight is typically staged, uh, that you kind of walk up to someone and shoot him, and, and uh, uh, the Gene Hackman character at one point is explaining this to the journalist that, you know, it's not the fast draw, that's not what matters. It's, and that's what shows up in this fight. Uh, Muddy is not even the first person to draw in the fight. He just draws points the weapon with an unshaking hand and kills one person after the other. And they're all shooting at him, but they're missing him. And it isn't the absurdity of these uh, uh, star, 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 star Wars stormtroopers. that they can. It's just that it's not that easy to point a gun at someone and shoot him. And what it comes down to is that uh, 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 the Eastwood figure is cold-blooded. And he has experience. He's done this before. And just one by one, he kills them. And, well, and they're just helpless in the face of this. And I find that very interesting because I'm sure that was closer to the truth. Uh, uh, evidently, this uh, drawing in a gunfight was very rare in the West. Uh, uh, it says, I saw Wyatt Earp had killed only one man before the gunfight at O.K. Corral, mm -hmm. and Virgil Earp did most of the shooting uh, at it, uh, but uh, because he'd had experience in the Civil War, Virgil Earp, and Wyatt didn't. He was y younger. Uh, but, uh, uh, and it is, again, a last hurrah. Uh, he, uh, clear, he has this sense of having outlived his time. Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, we've been seeing this from the beginning. The, the, the Western way was self-conscious about its being dated from the beginning. But it's a great film, and, and, and Eastward is just fabulous in it. And is it now over? 
I mean, the Western? Is that sort of the end? Uh, I mean, no, no, not at all. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, Deadwood, Deadwood was, and there's a Deadwood movie. It's 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 in production. It may be in post production by now, and I I hope it's as good as the show. Uh, but uh, so there are, there are westerns. Uh, there have been many westerns on television. A very good show was Hell on Wheels, which was about the making of the Transcontinental Railroad, and what an act of crony capitalism it was. A wonderful show, uh, and then, and what I would say is this though: the western has migrated to other genres, right. and that goes back to my original classification. That and I've actually even uh, these genres are not as fixed as people uh, think. Here, the American western becomes the Japanese samurai movie, which then becomes the Italian spaghetti western. In other words, it's easily adaptable. If you take my original formulation. You set anything in an alternate world, and it can be uh, a yeah, western. So Star Wars, obviously. Yeah, yeah, Star yeah. Wars, which, by the way, based on Hidden Fortress by Kurosawa. Uh, but uh, there was a, a, a science fiction movie made of High Noon, uh, showing my latest book that uh, uh, the zombie story of Walking Dead is a western. The zombies are the Indians. The uh, heroes and heroines are a wagon train moving through a frontier landscape with marauding uh, inhuman beings and with other outlaws and criminals. Uh, uh, it's so funny, uh, uh, somebody called the Carl, the little son, son in the show, why a twerp? And that's when I realized this. Uh, and I was comparing the relationship, uh, uh, Carl's thinks his father's dead. He's raised by another man who teaches him how to use a gun. That man is named Shane. And I mean, I just fell over when I saw that. These guys on the show were miles ahead of me that they were working within Western genres. So uh, the death of the Western is much exaggerated uh, and we will see it reproduced uh, again and again. You know, for that matter, David Milch walked into HBO proposing a show on Rome. That's what he wanted to do. And he said, oh, we got one in production. He said, why don't you do it as a Western? Uh, 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 Gene Roddenberry pitched uh, uh, Star Trek to NBC as Wagon Train to the Stars. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, again, part of it is if you take my notion that there's this whole category of shows that look at alternate worlds where a heroic ethic is possible, where everything is in middle class, where the middle class world is only in the process of developing, then you can see gangster stories, science fiction stories, horror stories like zombie movies, they are just transposed westerns. You've got the urban western, uh, Charles Bronson uh, in, in those uh, Death Wish, Death Wish yeah, movies, or Dirty Harry right. with Clint Eastwood. Uh, they had the same notion uh, of the Western. To hell with procedure. Right. Criminals, you can't, the authorities won't protect you. you. Go out and shoot them yourself. So in that sense, the, the spirit of the Western is a very important spirit of popular culture, which is not fully embracing middle class culture. Uh, as we put it, William Blake has this wonderful line, I care not whether a man be good or evil, I care if he be a wise man or a fool. In the West it would be, I care not if a man is good or evil, I care if he be a strong man or a weak. Uh, uh, and that ethic, when you see that, even if it's an urban drama, if it's in a mafia movie, or, you know, that's the spirit of the Western. Uh, and again, I, I feel this is my discovery that there's this um, divide in popular culture that either simply accepts the uh, middle class world as a given or offers an alternative to it, uh, which often reminds us why we need a middle class world. And I suppose uh, some of the more but, subtle yeah. popular culture movies or TV shows or whatever that quote accept the middle class world as a given subtly also yes. suggests its yeah, limitations or, yeah. or its uh, Seinfeld, insufficiencies. Yeah, Seinfeld was a great example of that. America fell in love uh, with Jerry, George, Elaine, and Kramer. We now know that Larry David hated them, uh, that he was trying to expose the emptiness of their lives. And the final episodes made that so clear, the audience hated the final episodes. Right. And if that wasn't enough, he went on to make Curb Your Enthusiasm. Uh, 
It's really interesting. I mean, at one point, uh, they propose the characters within the show propose their own show, and it's a show about nothing. Right. And that's the way Larry David conceived Seinfeld, that it was a contemporary waiting for Godot. He's trying to show how meaningless these people's lives are and their lack of attachment and their narcissism. Uh, so, yes, it was a deeply critical of that world, but, you know, <laughs> the people who were watching it were from that world. Uh, I never watched Friends, but I suspect it was even worse, uh, though not uh, self-consciously so. Right. So final word on the Western. I'm sure this, this conversation is going to produce a huge number of rentals for Netflix and Amazon and others, and uh, we should get some cut of that. I feel like you should be you know, reimbursed for this re, you know, reinvigorating if people find the tradition this of the Western. My, my book, Pop Culture, uh, the, Invisible, the Invisible Hand Pop Culture, has a whole section on the Western. I discuss The Searchers. I discuss the marvelous TV show, Have Gun, Will Travel, and show how it was related to Star Trek, because Gene Roddenberry wrote episodes for both, and uh, it shows how Gene Robert Roddenberry's vision of Star Trek grew out of Have Gun Will Travel. And finally, there's uh, an essay I'm really proud of, uh, uh, Order Out of the Mud, Deadwood in the State of Nature, where I work out this whole Hobbes Lock thing in connection with Deadwood and show how important uh, property rights are in Deadwood. There's this marvelous moment uh, towards the beginning of Deadwood when Wild Bill Hickok is excited, we're about to become a state, we'll have the right to vote, uh, uh, and uh, Timothy Oliphant, uh, 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 says, uh, I'll settle for property rights. It's an amazing Lockean moment. Uh, and indeed, Deadwood is this great defense of property rights and spontaneous order. So uh, rent all the movies you want, but buy my book. <laughs> I, I read some Lock and Hayek as well, right? Yeah. Paul Cantor, thank you very much for a genuinely uh, both fun and stimulating conversation about the Western. And we'll come back and do other aspects of popular culture and high culture soon as well. Okay, maybe some Shakespeare too. We should go back to Shakespeare at some point, right? And thank you for joining us on Conversations.